like a little sunny. So I'm gonna put these on. Okay, so today I had a request, or last night I had a request to talk about due diligence. So I can't pull up my whole list. I have a standard process that I kind of go through. Um, it usually starts at the front office. And at the front office, what I wanna know is asking the management, okay, what kind of amenities do you want here that we don't currently have? One, two, security. We're looking at their cameras, security gates, uh, any kind of LED lighting so that it's lit, uh, lit up at night. Uh, we're asking them about, um, for example, like for this pool, um, it has some pretty basic chairs. And so we'd wanna put in some nice cabanas there uh, and make it a little bit more of a resort style feeling because this is a newer property. So uh, we're excited about um, you know the possibility to make the front office look better. Also retheme the place. So we would definitely um, put a new, there's me. We definitely put um, a new facade at the front um, and then also focus on um, doing a different sign at the front. We also name our properties after women who have affected our lives, so um, that's part of our rebranding. So uh, really wanting to know the ins and outs of, for example, what the front office is like, what it smells like when you come in. They actually have a, t call it like a test unit, but essentially a model unit that's in the front office so you can immediately see like what the finish out looks like on a nice unit. Um, attached to this has, they have a pool room, so you know, you want to check that out. Um, and then also mechanical electrical plumbing. So for us, we have uh, water heaters that are actually tankless, which is super cool here, in a boiler room. So there's no boilers, which is awesome. Uh, check, no deferred maintenance there. Um, whenever you look at this, this is the electrical meter. So you're seeing these are individually, uh, the meter, individually metered. So. We don't have to worry about billing back that bill. It just goes directly to the residents. Um, and we, what we actually do is we provide the service for them. It's already turned on at a premium price and then they just move in and then they start paying their bills. Um, basically not to us, but a third party company. And then we take the, um, the profit there. So let anyway, me back to due diligence. So uh, mechanical electrical plumbing. So here we looked at the, the plumbing. Uh, this is a 80s plus build. Uh, so the plumbing here we already found has been replaced uh, to PVC or was built with PVC, excuse me. Um, there, the, the pump room looks good. Um, the mechanical uh, room when it comes to, um, there's no HVACs, they're individual here. Um, HVAC, what I mean is like a boiler chiller. There's, there's no big uh, boiler chiller, uh, which suck, I've had those in a main room to go look at the barcode, which would give you the year of the vintage. And so if you go Google, you know, replacements uh, on those things, and I'm gonna get this wrong, uh, you know, every like 10 years, I think you have to replace your boiler chiller. So um, you would know the expense that you have to budget for, for boiler chiller. We don't have those here, so that's awesome. Um, so then we have um, no mechanical, so electrical, plumbing, roof, and foundation. Uh, we walked around the properties to look at all the foundations. And so this is interesting because there's actually drainage here. And so we're really not too worried about the foundation. First off, I'm looking foundation-wise in the building. If there's any horizontal cracks, that means there's some big issues. So we did a walk around the whole property, didn't see any of that. The second thing would be stair-step cracks. So you would see in this uh, brick here, it would literally look like a stair step. And so that means that there's some sideways activity in the foundation. However, these are slabs, but anyway, you'd still see the activity the same way. We didn't see any of that here. So there's no foundation issues. Um, so now we have checked off the security, the front office, um, mechanical we've checked off. So we call it M E P sandwich. So mechanical, electrical, plumbing, roof, and foundation. So it's like a sandwich. You have the roof up top and the foundation here. So we know the foundation's good. So we have the mechanical, that's good. So electrical, what you wanna do is check inside the unit. So we looked at the electrical boxes because if you get a Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac government back loan, which is the best loan really to get on these kinds of properties, multifamily, um, they are gonna require that any kind of uh, wiring that you have that's aluminum. So it's usually like Stablock brand and there's some others that you can Google for, for any kind of aluminum arcing that will cause fires and they won't, uh, insurance companies will charge extra or won't insure it. And then also government loans won't give you the loan. So you can't get that like low interest rate long-term with interest only, which make these deals really juiced and work. Um, so anyway, so we looked at that here, they have some square D boxes and again, Google that, but those are uh, good to go. The rest of the units are copper wiring. So we're not worried about that. So essentially foundation's good. Mechanicals are good. Um, plumbing, we, we checked as well under the sinks and uh, got some more data on that. They're PVC. So mechanical, uh, sorry, foundation, 
plumbing, mechanical, electrical is good. So MEP and foundation is good. The only thing I have left is the roofs here. So there's, there's some schools out there that teach their students that they need to like physically like get on a ladder and take a picture and get on the roof. You don't need to do that. <laughs> um, just look at it. So what I'm looking for are two things, three things really. Um, so first off, I can just see from looking from a distance that this is not new. Um, you can see that there are water lines up at the top, so potentially they're old. Also, you can just simply ask the old owner uh, or seller and then the broker, what is the age of the replacements of the roof? Here there's 10 roofs, so um, I would want to know what the cost is, and I actually use an artificial intelligence software that you can Google. I totally forget the name, but you can just Google it. Um, it gives you one trial for free, so I just use a new email every time I use it. And essentially it just goes up in a sat image or satellite image on all the roofs here at this property. And because uh, what this is going to be made of of so many squares or square footage basically, but squares of the roof, uh, I think this is like a 30 year shingle, I'm just guessing. Um, but you would then input the square footage by, and they'd give you how many squares of roof you would have to pay for to replace all the roof. And then you would estimate, am I gonna use TPO? Am I gonna use 30 year shingles? You would put in the material and then it would also estimate the labor. So uh, you would also be able to figure out from that image uh, in that software about around about like what would it cost to replace all the roofs. You'd wanna stick that in your budget here. The other thing I'm looking for, it, two things, get, get closer. La 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 la. Uh, big thing is income opportunities. That's like the biggest last thing after the deferred maintenance. So I just went through deferred maintenance. So when I'm talking about replacements, looking up here, this is whoop, the soffit uh, up on the roof here. So like, uh, not here, but here, there. Yeah, at the top of all the balconies at the top. So to me, once we did the walk around um, tour, all of the um, soffit looks good. And then the other thing you wanna know, I wanna know, do they have gutters? Yes, they have gutters. So then that's also gonna help with the proper drainage and lack of slip and fall accidents and uh, pooling of water and ruining the grass. And I mean, going on for days, gutters are a good thing. Um, you wanna look up here. So I said the, right here, the soffit is underneath the decks. The fascia, I'm trying to point, this is hard. The fascia is like this and like uh, this this sort of like siding that's connected to the roof. And so essentially there's some wood rot there, right? So essentially what we'd wanna see is like, what is it gonna take for me to replace the roof cost? Uh, what does that cost materials and labor? And then um, any kind of rotted siding here, what is that gonna take to replace? So we have to go estimate that. I don't have these numbers yet, but the other thing I wanna see is I already went inside all the units to know, okay, there's 50% of these that can be premium. That's good for me because that means I can leave some meat on the bone for the next buyer. Upgrade 25%, 30%, leave some meat on the bone. Uh, so, cause you always have to have your end buyer in mind. Uh, but the point is, is that whenever you go to estimate uh, your interiors, you wanna see what they're already doing because like they're paying to continue to replace these units. So we'll get a scope from them on like what they pay for their resurfacing, what they're paying for their backsplash they have, they have black appliances. I personally think that because of the vintage of the deal being 80s, there's some really cool apartments that I've seen in like Addison area. So it's a little more hip than out here. This is North Richland Hills area. Um, I think that what we should do is put in a big mirror inside the kitchen area to make the unit much bigger feeling uh, and then change the paint to a two-tone paint. Again, what that does is the, the light ceiling, it, it raises the ceiling so it seems bigger. So uh, that would be one uh, kind of funny thing that we could do for some like premium tested units. Um, so I'm out of breath. <laughs> I'm going up the hill. Um, so anyway, so we went over the mechanicals, uh, the security, the front office, um, and then I need to get back what does it cost to do an interior so that I can estimate, well, if we're going to do 50% of the interiors, what are those costs? And then we figure out also when it comes to the interiors, um, okay, for me, from my calculations, I see, we're going to go back down the hill. From my calculations, I see there's only four, plan four floor plans. Uh, that show a return on investment that would get us our money back in 24 months or less, which is the goal, so that we can sell the property in two, three years. Would We're always going to say, oh, we're going to hold it for five plus, but if we could sell early, great, and as long as we sell at our exit price, great. 
But so what we want to do is we want to figure out, you know, what does it cost to do the interiors at their current price? See if I can beat it. So that's a value add there. Um, also, what you want to do is figure out what floor plans you can get your return on your investment in under 24 months or two years. And so basically when you get that analysis, mine says that out of 136 units, that 30% of it would give me an immediate return on investment, depending on how much we spend per unit. So those are the units that we'd want to knock out in the first year, honestly, uh, to two years, because we are going to have people likely that lapse their lease as we increase our market rent. Uh, the other thing that you know I wanted to figure out, like I said, is um, not just return on investment, and that's a cool term, but what I mean is like, okay, what are our current units, floor plans? What are they unrenovated, the cost? If we were to renovate the floor plans that give us a good return on investment, what is the premium market rent that we could get it like today? And then by the time we get it, because we would have to wait till someone leaves, get in the unit, um, do it, and then market rent's gonna increase, I believe, in the next two, two years. It's, it's kind of gone flat, but it's going to increase here because, you know, the Fed, while they're staying steady right now, they've already said there has to be three rate drops this year. So we're already in Q2, like, well, we're about to be in Q2. So basically, like, we're going to have that happening here soon. So anyway, point is, is uh, we want to figure out return on investment time uh, based on the amount of cost per unit, based on the amount of rent that we can continue to get. So, but we, we base our return on investment as of the rent today, and then look at later on. Um, so we don't do any kind of like aggressive pro formas, like, oh, we think we can get $500 in rent in five years from now. And so therefore our return on investment is like, no, we just say we are charging this today. And so as of today, we are this much under market. So therefore we could get a return on investment by renovating these today of this. So in the future, it'll be, it'll be a greater return, but always want to be conservative in your estimates with what you're charging and what you're planning to charge. Now, I didn't go through super amenities in the beginning, but they don't have any place for the kids to play. So they need a play set. They need some pool furniture. They need some cabanas. They need a, a facelift on the front. Um, and so those are things that people might be asking like, oh, why, why is that important? That's like a non-revenue producing item. But I have found that when people want to go, oh, look at that property it's 100% because of the curb appeal. And I've had a property that accidentally changed the curb appeal because the city decided to put in new sidewalks, they decided to put in new roads, and our leasing traffic went up like 50% overnight. And so knowing that that's such a big deal, um, that's one of the places to focus, even though it's not a return like a unit. Okay, so I went through mechanical, electrical, plumbing, roofing foundation, which is the deferred maintenance. I went through the unit interiors, a return on that investment. Um, the other things really to go to uh, to look through, my associate was here with me and she had some great questions. So when was the last fire inspection? Did we pass? When was the last time that the city came out to do a code inspection? Did we pass? When is the next code inspection? Um, our current insurance company, when is the last time that we had a claim on the insurance? Um, because that will also kind of uh, feed into the probability of success if we needed to claim on the roof, you know, if there was a hail claim or whatever. Um, so like... That's kind of it. And then um, the last thing I guess I would do would be after I get all those costs back, uh, especially insurance, especially like the pro forma insurance. So the, the numbers we put in that we've guessed about for what insurance is going to be because it's always higher now. Uh, the ones, the, the numbers that brokers have used versus ours, the brokers have used a little higher than ours. So that's actually good news because that means that we'll make a higher return if we just use a policy where we already have a master policy with other properties with our management company, um, then we can actually drop that like up to 300 bucks a unit per month uh, for the insurance rate. So that will also help save and juice our returns too. Um, so we're just looking again for value add opportunities. I didn't really go over that, but what we noticed is that, um, so I don't know if you can see this, but like right here, this yard, if it was me and I had a dog, I would want to live on the bottom unit and I would definitely want to extend this out. So rip it out and replace it. So one, some, some replacements we've done like this that are way bigger were a thousand a unit in um, matching wood. So I'm not sure that looks like cedar plank. So we'd, we'd want to match them to make them look nicer. And then we'd also want to extend them out and start charging like 50 bucks or so a month for these bottom units. So 
Uh, that's one great improvement. Uh, also, the water meter, there is like a, I forget the name, but it's like an attenuator we can put on the master meter, which helps reduce the overall water bill. Even though management's telling me they bill it back, I mean, you, you can't bill back 100%, you have to bill back, whatever. So there's a portion of the water that the property is paying for. And so if we're able to put a, a adjustment at the meter level, that if any of the water goes crazy, there's a leak, it actually will reduce the flow and alert us that there's a leak. And so we, boom, management gets, gets to go fix it. So then we don't waste, sometimes on a 300 unit property, for example, about 1.5 million gallons a year in wasted water on like, oh, our sprinkler head broke off or like somebody like let the toilet run because the flapper's broken in the toilet. There's, there's so many things. So for value add, yards is, is a great way to, to add some value and have some rent here. People really like those. Uh, the master meter head, that's one thing. Also, each of these balconies here, they have a storage. Uh, nobody's paying for these. <laughs> so we're going to add 10 bucks a month. Not crazy, but I mean, just multiply it by 136 units. There, there's, there's some money right there every month. Um, and then there are no vending machines um, in the laundry. Well, there is no laundry area, sorry. There's no vending machines in the mail area, in the individual units. The property is buying the machines and they're renting them out to the residents. I would want to actually uh, leave them how they are. And then for the remaining units, potentially go to a, a company and work out a deal where you rent from them. So we don't buy anything and then we charge a higher price to have them here. Someone else services them, not us. And then we also never had any capital expense in the beginning, so it's an infinite return. So say we get on a contract with them, I don't know, we pay them $25 a month per machine. Our resident has two machines. Uh, they pay $60 a month. That's another $10 in profit per unit. All of these units have um, hookups for the washer, or sorry, yeah, washer and dryer, which is also another awesome opportunity for income. Um, and then I'm trying to think, what was the other stuff that we came up with? I take notes by recording myself in uh, otter.ai while I'm walking, so I don't remember everything, but yeah, I took notes so that we could go back and plug in our adjustments to our numbers. Um, and then uh, really for us, taxes, insurance, and then wanting to know what our overall renovation is gonna look like, and then some other income producing items. Oh, that's the other one. They're not having anyone pay for any upfront parking. So we would want to adjust or pave these spots and then, because uh, I, I just think it would look nicer if it was redone. Um, eh, well, anyway, we want to patch in this, like, a, I don't like the tar, be concrete instead. But anyway, be able to restripe these two and then add in so many units that are, um, that are reserved and they, they have to pay like $25, $20 or whatever a month. Um, so that would be another value add. So there's, there's many uh, value add opportunities and that's definitely something that, um, that we focus on because it's not, it's, it's much easier to do these little, little changes than having to like overhaul units. And I think that I actually know the current owner of this place that they did a, an incredible job, um, using exponential materials in Dallas. So I'm very familiar with all the product that they use and it's, it's good stuff. Um, and so they've already done most of the work and we would only have to do 30% of the units if we wanted to over a two year period. Um, anyway, so uh, that is on due diligence. And this isn't even like the, the DD. This is what you do when you go look at a deal in my head, but I write it down verbally using transcription with otter.ai. When we actually come in and do the due diligence, we actually bring in crews that come in, scope the lines. You must scope your lines. I had a buyer that bought something from us and they never did that. So during, you know, the end of closing, we had a, a pipe burst, you know, and they're like, do you need to pay to replace it? And I'm like, you didn't scope the lines, dude. You have to do that. Don't retrade. Get, get out of here. This is unprofessional. So I do a, a visual scope of everything that needs to be done. I budget for all the visual things. Now we could run into at this property, I think, not just the roof, but an issue with the plumbing, but we won't know until we like camera and scope the lines. When we have a master plumber come in and do so, they'll actually take um, audio and video. Uh, they'll talk while they're going through uh, their exam and then they'll come up with a report telling us what needs to be replaced so then we would know what our total cost is uh, during due diligence but we can't do that scoping until we're under contract um, and these days just to be transparent with you they used to make you do like hard earnest money or non-refundable just to take a look at the property and there's a thing called an EAA or early access agreement that you can typically negotiate where something like that like a scope 
Like that would be super easy. There's 10 buildings here. I just have to have someone dip in for like, I don't know, 1500 bucks to come and look at the wines. Um, well, not even, it would probably be like closer to half of that because this is a smaller property. I'm just thinking of a recent one. Um, and so when they're coming in to scope the lines, that's when you know exactly what your costs are going to be because that's a hidden cost because it's under the ground. Right. Um, and I, I can't see through the buildings. I don't have x-ray vision. So, um, yeah, that would, that would be my process for looking at it. Then I know how to adjust my numbers. Then I know when I make an offer, it's a solid offer and I'm not going to go through and retrade, uh, unless, like I said, the market has changed where it's a softer market. So we do sometimes retrade if I were to get into this property and, we had a whole building, which luckily these buildings are not um, super long. I've had some where like the, the sections of the building or the phases have been like 100 units long. So this is not that bad, which is good news. Because if we have one issue with plumbing, say like here, um, it's not going to be like 180000 to rip the whole thing up. That would be on a larger section or, or um, a larger phase of a property. So this is also great the way that it was built where it's easier to, to fix those issues. So yeah, so this is just kind of like a day in the life. Whenever it comes to buying properties that are multifamily, you get your stuff together from the outside, everything you can see with your eyes. The brokers don't want to hear an excuse as to like why you have to ask for a retrade on something that you could see in plain sight. Then once you pay to get in there under contract, earnest money payment under contract, then you need to be scoping the lines. You'd be sending someone to look at the electrical. I mean, we're good here. I already saw it. Um, lenders already approved it. This is a loan assumption. So easy peasy. Um, but anyway, point is, is, um, you know, you don't do the like hard, uh, scoping or like the, the, the heavy due diligence exam until you're under contract. So this is just the process of like making an offer. Um, just knowing your stuff. So some of this you learn, uh, by the way, if it had a boiler, there's a barcode on the boiler, typically depending on the brand, you would just go look at the fourth and the fifth number in the barcode and it would tell you typically the year that that uh, machine um, was was built, or not built, was uh, installed basically new. Um, and then you'd be able to see, okay, well I know I need to replace a boiler every 10 years, so we're gonna have to budget however many thousands, like, I don't know, 20 grand per boiler for however many buildings we have boilers in. This has tankless, so we don't have to do that, which is awesome. Um, and then when it comes to boiler, the other thing is chiller. So a chiller, God, is like, if you were to like harvest one out of a jail and get one used, you might be able to get one for like, it used to be 32 grand now, probably like close to 50, uh, and then get it recertified. Um, and usually a property doesn't have too many huge chillers. Usually it's like in one central area or two central areas, but it could be up to like 300 grand minimum to replace chillers that are, you know, aged and not replaced. Uh, they also have, um, lines and, and connecting piping and, uh, what's it called? Um, the, the metal part that connects it, um, flashing, excuse me, pieces that connect it, all that could, needs to be replaced along with it. So it's a very expensive venture and it could be like 500 grand or whatever, just to replace that one mechanical thing, but they don't have that here. That's the good thing about new properties, newer than 80 is that they usually typically don't have uh, a big chiller. And so then each of these units has their own individual HVACs. Now, um, being in the Metroplex here, the plus side to looking at these HVAC replacements is that um, we have a guy here with a warehouse that we could do a full system for like 3,300 bucks and then pay his labor to install these systems, which is awesome. Um, so you definitely wanna find an EPA certified uh, tech that's working at your property for maintenance because in Texas, bugs, and HVAC are a big deal. I've lived in my properties and I do now. And so I have experienced a summer where I had fleas. I've experienced a summer where I had no AC. I couldn't go to uh, events and meetings. I couldn't work, I couldn't think. Like you've gotta get that stuff handled and have a budget for it and have someone that can handle it as they go out so that you know that you're not gonna um, have to take it out of your cash flow. You have it already pre-budgeted. So um, don't have much more to say, but that's, that's essentially what we do when we tour. Um, that's going on in my head. I take notes and then now I'm gonna go adjust the underwriting and then show this to a couple of our um, private equity groups.